Welcome everyone. My name's uh, Deborah McDougall, and this is a picture of me. This is the second online lecture for, or the second lecture for the module on society and culture. And I've titled it Wach Blanc Structure, a term from Michael French Smith's book, Contested Models of Society in Familiar and Faraway Places. And I want to leap right into that book and direct you to look at a couple of chapters, chapter six and seven, that deal with um, Krager Islanders reflecting on their own on their own social structure, which is our, our topic for today. So if you look at the beginning of chapter um, chapter six, he's just finished a chapter looking at whether or not Krager is poor um, or um, because people have very little cash, but they have a lot of their land. And that, that chapter six then starts, if land is at the heart of village life, family ties, sometimes through marriage, but primarily through descent through males from a common male ancestor, patrilineal descent, are the heart of questions about land. So this is a chapter that's going to look at family ties, and, fa and especially on the ways in which villagers of, of Kragor are trying to understand their own descent relationships. And if you flip to page 90, there's a paragraph there where Michael French Smith is talking about rights not only to land but also to magic and other aspects of status. He says, um, when people explain why those rights are distributed as they are, they invariably invoke sequences of male forebears receding far into the past. In 1998, I found that a great many Krager villagers had adopted the talk Pizen version term of the English term social structure to talk about those lines of descent, referring to them as structure. This part of the contemporary Krager vocabulary may have come from the Susak Krager people in towns who are quite familiar with the English term. At least one village resident had also studied social science as a seminary student. In any case, it provided a concise label for the project of recording knowledge of clan ancestors that some of us had undertaken together, which my Krager collaborators called the work of law structure, that is the work of structure, or simply structure work, structure work. One product of structure work is a set of charts showing sequences of descent through males reaching many generations into the past, the kinds of charts that Richard showed you of patrilineal, patrilineal kinship last week. Almost as important as these records of the ancestors' names, Smith goes on to say, are the stories that go with them, stories about the migrations and the other exploits of the ancestors that eventually brought them to what is now Krager and through which they acquired whatever knowledge and rights they passed down to their descendants. So I found the, pas the passage is interesting um, because it deals with, um, with my topic for today, which is really... Models of social structure, and I'm gonna, let me just, um, models of social structure and especially models of descent and how those are taken up and mobilized by people like Krager villages. I'm also interested in what falls out of kinship when people are focusing on those lineal models of descent. And I'm also interested in asking questions about why Krager people and others in situations like them are concerned about writing down genealogies and stories about their ancestors. Now there is a paradox here. The entire point of a faraway familiar place, as you have undoubtedly gathered now that you're um, finishing the book, is that Krager villagers are thoroughly modern. Um, don't be fooled by the lack of technological gear, says Michael French Smith at the end of the second or third chapter. They are thoroughly modern. And this uh, concern 
with making sense of the past in a particular way. A concern about capturing the past in a particular way is a thoroughly modern concern. So even though people are thinking about their ancestors and thinking also about the kinds of relationships that link them to this particular land and to one another in this very local place, in this highly specific way, that concern is a concern that their grandparents and great-grandparents would not have had. They're drawing distinctions between customary ways of doing things and modern ways of doing things that just wouldn't have been relative, uh, relevant a couple of generations ago. So Michael French Smith uh, makes the point a few times that Cragger villagers and people of the eastern Sepik um, in many generations past would have seen themselves as part of a social world focused and centered on, on them. But now they see themselves as marginal to um, a global world that's centers of power are elsewhere. So they're grappling with their own models of society and models of knowledge and society and power and value that are coming from the outside and that they're experiencing as they do things like sell coconuts to foreign corp um, foreign or to local companies that sell them on a global market as they consider the possibility of having um, large-scale resource extraction on their land, especially mining or logging. Um, and that, if you were here in person, I would ask you to reflect on why you think that people are starting to be so concerned with writing down those genealogies. One reason perhaps has to do with just the passing of um, generations, with real changes of the 20th century and people be realizing that their past may be forgotten in a certain way. But it also has to do with wanting to get things straight in case outsiders come and want to um, exploit resources. People will be well prepared to make those claims to local land. Okay, I want to say a few more things about uh, models of social structure, but cast the lens a bit wider uh, to begin with and think back on what you have all learned so far about personhood, about social relationships, and, about, um, and relate that to questions about social relationships and groups. Now, as Richard um, discussed in earlier lectures, well, a lot of Western social theory, both by social theorists and people like sociologists and anthropologists, but also ordinary people, often tends to assume that persons are autonomous individuals. When we ask questions about the nature of society, we say, well, how do people enter into social relationships? How do they join groups? Um, what makes them have faith in particular gods? How do they acquire property and so on? And how is that held? But as you've learned from uh, several of the readings, the readings on the Wari people of the um, Amazon, readings about Central Desert Aboriginal people, um, that was the focus of last, la last uh, week's reading by Diane Bell, you've learned that other people don't think of personhood in that way. Um, they may consider people to be individuals to some degree, but the person is first and foremost made in and through social relationships um, and by in those relationships with other people and sometimes non-human entities like God, spirits, the land, um, and so on. Uh, and, and that in a certain way, they might think of themselves as being those things or, or being born of those things. So you saw in the Diane Bell reading, women talking of not only land, but ritual objects as, as addressing them with kin terms. Um, so from a worldview like that, your natural questions are not, well, how do I enter into social relations or how do I become part of a group? That's almost kind of taken for granted. But one of the things I really like about Michael French Smith's book is that he 
um, makes it clear this isn't some really stark dichotomy between different people. So he says, um, in when he's talking, when he's talking about models of relation personhood on page thirty, um, he's talking about people struggling with the new challenges of a cash economy in a place where sharing is really taken for granted. And when he's talking on page 82 about land um, and the idea of anthropologists, including actually one of the scholars who's written about the ways in which people um, are really made by and connected to one another through land is James Leach, who's here at UW as a research fellow. F Smith um, describes those theories says they help to explain a lot, but we shouldn't overblow them by forgetting the ways in which Western individuals are also really bound to and feel themselves to be made by particular places and also the way that Melanesian people um, may lose those connections and, and, and not be as bound to social life. But we don't want to over-essentialize that, but these are quite different ways of approaching questions about social relationships. And one of the things I want to suggest is that these are different models, but those Western understandings of person groups and prop group and property have really had global influence, not because they were right, but because Western social forms have exerted power over places like Kragor for um, a couple of centuries. So in a, a model, a really basic understanding of society that says, okay, Where's the group and how are people members and how do we link those individuals into groups and how do we bound those groups so we know who's in and who's out? Those models, those really basic assumptions and basic questions about society um, are ones that people like people in Crager Village and elsewhere in the world have to deal with, whether or not they resonate with their own indigenous understandings. So models of social structure. No model captures all aspects of social reality. I want to suggest that models of social structure both shape and depict social relations. So it's not just that we're um, whether that that when people um, describe or depict social relations or institutions, they're just depicting it from afar, like a like a satellite map or something. These are also a little bit like. Um, architectural plans to, to draw a metaphor from the anthropologist Clifford Geertz. They're sort of map that tells us how things ought to be as well as how they are. They're models of society and models for society. And I really want to emphasize that these models are contested and they're enmeshed in power relationships. Now, this is all rather abstract to think about in relation to thoroughly modern Melanesia, Kairuru, Kairiru Island, which Michael French Smith has talked about, and the Western Solomon Islands, not far from there, but in a different country where I've spent um, many years doing, uh, several years doing research. Uh, that's what I want to come back to, but first I want to talk to a much, about a much more familiar example. That is our institution, UWA. What is UWA? And here I actually want to pull up just briefly those three 19th century social theorists that Richard mentioned, Max Weber, Marx, um, Karl Marx, and Emil Durkheim, to sort of illustrate how they might differently, or an, uh, the, their approaches would differently answer a question like, UW, well, what is UWA? What is UWA? Well, where do you see it? If you're a social anthropologist trying to get a sense of this sort of uh, this complex thing that is a university, you might rock up to a ritual like graduation. And I have a picture of Tim Minchin here just because um, he was the first picture that came up, but also because he gave the most awesome ever commencement occasional address that was full of wit and wisdom and really good advice. And so everybody should uh, click that link and go listen to it. Unfortunately, it has very little to do with my lecture today, but there you go. But this ritual event brings otherwise quite fragmented individuals, people who may not see themselves ever. When I attend graduation in my 
graduate robe. I see people, my, my colleagues from even across the faculty and across the university, I otherwise never see and I don't know them. And yet we're brought together in a way in which it's very clear that we are in a part of some broader social whole. And the speeches, such as that given by Minchin and others, if they're effective, they really, and his really was, <laughs> I think, they really make us feel that we're part of that, that we're no longer just an individual struggling uh, and um, struggling away, whether we're teaching or whether we're studying, but we are as part of this broader community that has a certain solidarity. You also see it in American universities, extremely clearly in sports events. Um, and you, you know, you see that in any kind of sports events when you have that sense of your own identity being really bound up with a collection of people you might otherwise not see, but are brought together um, as uh, supporting a team. And that unity is then somehow symbolized in the, in the team that's playing. So. That really is a Durkheimian approach. Durkheim's question was, how are these, you know, how are individuals brought together, especially in non-state societies? And, um, and he was also interested in what religion was. He thinks religion is all about society, that religion um, uh, projects a, a sense of social unity onto a transcendent plane. God is society. God is our representation of society. Okay, now, we might ask if we know a little bit more about the university's everyday workings, whether that symbolic solidarity of graduation ceremonies is a facade that hides deep contradictions and struggles. Who, in fact, is the University of Western Australia when we get beyond the rituals of things like graduations that make us students faculties, um, graduands, alumni feel like part of this collective. On the 19th of March, so last Thursday, I got an email from our Vice Chancellor Paul Johnson that was um, expressing UWA's continuing support for the deregulation agenda that will allow the universities rather than government to set their fees. Um, and that was after, of course, the Senate knocked back that, that bill. The next day, I got an email from the National Tertiary Education Union, of which I am a member, which represents academic and general staff uh, nationally. And that letter said, hurrah, fee regulation is defeated in the Senate for a second time, um, but Pine is still going to put it forward, and we are going to continue to contest contest it. Well, there are a lot of union members of UWA in the faculty and uh, the academic and general staff. Most of them I have talked to ha have a lot of hesitation about deregulation. So does the University of Western Australia continue, continue to support the deregulation agenda? Who is that un the university, is it Paul Johnson? Is it the, it's speaking on behalf of the executive? Is it the Union of Academics or the National Union of Students? We can also ask what in fact, so what sort of institution is this that we're all part of? Is it a corporation? Um, a senior administrator was quoted in the Academic Voice, which is the newsletter of a staff association it's saying that UWA is a billion dollar education corporation and we don't want to jeopardize its reputation. We've worked hard to achieve our international reputation. It's easy to lose. So it's a billion dollar corporation. Or might we say, well, yeah, but it's actually a public institution funded by Commonwealth money designed to serve the state, the country, the world, the citizens, whatever. And what are students? Are you... Um, future leaders? Are you citizens? Are you consumers? Again, the um, executive may say that we're a billion dollar corporation, but the union of staff says, it critiques this 
neoliberal paradigm that reimagines Jin's education and research as commodities and students as customers. Vice chancellors no longer even aspire to be educational leaders, but as one assured me, they're CEOs of transnational corporations. So I don't know the answer to these questions, but what I do know is that they're actually up, they're being, they're being contested. And it's not just a question of which depiction, which model of the university is true, but it's a question of who has the power to reinforce their particular view. And I also know that by putting forward a view of what the university is and um, through, for instance, the staff, um, the staff association and then the union, we are trying to shape what it becomes and how it functions. And that's true for the contesting vision of the university that's being put forward by the executive. So we've got these conflicting perspectives. Okay, so if a Durkheimian perspective emphasizes oh, how are these individuals pulled into a social unity and experience themselves as at least temporarily um, united in that society, an approach to social structure from a Marxist or Marxian perspective would emphasize those sorts of conflict that different people with different levels of power um, in a, any social structure are, are going to have different visions of what that unit is and different visions of how it ought to be. And if we're asking who's got legitimate authority to um, the, the legitimate right to exert authority over such things as university policy, then we're starting to ask questions that might come out of a Weberian perspective. So there are all sorts of different ways of understanding social structure and institutional structures. And we can see that in our, in our own university. So back now to faraway places. And this here uh, is a picture of the place where I worked. This is Rai Michaelo cutting a sugar cane with his machete. This is the village of Peinuna, small island off of that. The provincial capital is over there. It's a place that's situated um, let me just jump to the map, within um, the Solomon Islands. So here's Papua New Guinea. Over here are the islands off of Wewak in the East Sipic province, which Michael French Smith is writing about. Quite a ways down the archipelago, but still within the same broad culture region are the islands of the Solomon Islands. And that national boundary goes right down the middle of an interlinked cultural group here. And I've worked in this group, Renonga, this um, long, thin island. From here to the provincial capital is about a, um, it's about um, 20 miles. Um, and I'm also going to be talking or showing you clips from a film made about logging on this island, Rendova. And this is a picture of Renonga, which like Kairiru is mountainous and difficult to walk across um, and rather exhilarating. But let me go back because um, I wanted to go back. So that, that, there's, my, there's my faraway familiar place. But I want to ask this question, this question about land ownership. So I started with the quote from Michael French Smith about if you want to know what's at the center of the village, it's land. And if you want to know about land, you've got to know about kinship. What is Melane What are Melanesians' relationships to land? And this was also a focus of the Paul Silito reading. Are they land owners? Are Aboriginal Australians land owners? In a certain way, this is a silly question. We know the answer. Yes, they are land owners. Unlike lots of so-called poor people around the world, including Aboriginal Australians, people of Melanesia have um, hold their own land. It's not legally registered, but Nobody um, else owns it. They pass it on by their own means from generation to generation. Some land is alienated, but most people of this region are very lucky um, and fortunate to have their land. But is that relationship to land one of possession? Do they possess land? Do they own it? Is it something outside of themselves that is owned? And some, um, the anthropologist Daniel de Copé, writing of a Melanesian, um, 
Solomon Island Society to the east of where I worked wrote, it's better to say that land own pe owns people rather than people owning land. So there's this connection, a deep relationship between people and territory, between clans, ancestral clans, and land in both Kragor and in Penuna in Renongo where I worked. People um, think of their ancestors or tell their mythical origin stories that depict them as coming out of the land itself, up from the sea, up, up from a river, down from heaven, and so forth. So this is a deeply emplaced worldview, as is also true for Aboriginal Australians, as you learned in the bell reading. And yet in Melanesia, and this differs somewhat from Aboriginal Australia, uh, there's also a real sense that you own or you control, you have power over property that you create by clearing the large forest of trees to create clearings for gardens, like this one in the picture, to create clearings for settlement and to plant nut trees. In the past, it was nut trees, now coconut trees. So there's this sense um, that is not so different from the sense that we have in Western theories of property from John Locke through Marx, that property is created by human labor and its land is transformed by later labor and that creates property. That is the argument that was used to declare Australia a terra nullius, um, Aboriginal people were on the land, but they didn't transform it in the ways that those of us coming out of agricultural societies expect it to be transformed. But in Melanesia, you really have this kind of um, two-level sense of, of connection. That in, in one sense, property is created by the person who does the work, sweats, you know, who put his sweat into the land is often the way people talk about it by clearing, cl clearing the forest, but then regardless of who's cleared to create these limited forms of property, that land is really bound to the ancestors, uh, the clan ancestors of the people who kind of emerged with it. That's not, doesn't change even if people have rights to gardens and groves. So people distinguish between things like land and things that are on the land, like gardens, groves, coconut groves, and settlement sites. Silito writes about land as a factor of production and capitalism. Goes along with labor and capital. Melanesia has um, successive colonial governments and post-colonial governments have done pretty much everything they can do to encourage capital investment, including keeping wages um, very, very low, despite high demand, uh, basically stealing some of the best coastal land from people and giving it at very low rates to multinational corporations from the 1900s onward and so forth. Um, but still, land uh, is not entirely pulled into that um, economic system. Now, one of the things that's happened, that ha tend tended to happen in places like East New Britain, which Silito writes in the Western Solomons, I think also in Kragor, is that with um, the rise of plantation capitalism, people tended to emphasize individual rights to property. So if a man clears the land, he is very likely to pass it on to his own children. Um, so there's a sort of emphasis on this bit, that, that, that an individual person or family has the property they create through their labor. Now with a turn in the late 20th century, especially the 80s and 90s, to resource capitalism, logging, mining, um, palm oil, there's been an emphasis not on those individual rights to property through labor, but on clan rights, the overarching um, connection of a group to a big territory. But both those individual rights and the assertion of a group collective identity involves the cutting off of kinspeople. Let me try to explain that. Um, through a case study of how people I knew in Renonga, and there's my map again, um, negotiate rights in everyday contexts and then how they negotiate them when they're contesting a logging project. So we have to think more about what clans are. 
Richard showed you models like this. This is a picture of matrilineal descent in Kragor. People trace clan identity through men, so the triangles there. Um, but where I worked, people tended to emphasize matrilineal descent. Some areas of the region, they would affiliate with either clan of, the par of either parent, but where I worked, people at least emphasize this matrilineality. So instead of a man as a founding ancestor, you have a woman and her children are red. That's marking the membership in the clan. But this guy's children are not of the clan. Her children are, and her children are. So his sister's children are his clan mates. His own children are not. And in each generation, that's the same. So her children are part of the clan. Her sister's children are part of the clan. Her brother's children are not. So on. Now, Descent is traced through women, but normally women are not the political leaders. So the chiefs, the leaders, that's a term that was really introduced from the outside by colonial government. Chiefs tend to be men. That's changing somewhat where I work, and I won't talk about that right now, but it's quite interesting. But chiefs tended to be, so in a classic sense, this man might be the leader of the group, and then not his children, but his sister's children would take over clan leadership of, and, and leadership of the land. Now, in talking about descent systems and, and social groups, Michael French Smith makes some comment like, when people find it necessary to form themselves as groups, people are not walking around with a sort of sign, I am X clan on their um, foreheads while they go about their daily lives. It's not as though it's only the red team that does anything together. Um, a woman and her husband are of different clans, but that household is the main, usually the main economic group. When people come together for community work, they work with all kinds of their um, in-laws, their collateral um, relatives, and so forth. So so just as we um, don't go about always thinking of ourselves as UWA, and it's often only in the ritual moment of graduation that we feel ourselves very strongly to be part of this broader collective, so too it's often, particularly in funerals, when a clan member dies, that people really come together and mark themselves as persons of a particular clan. But when people begin to think, well, what is our social structure? And they begin to depict it with these kinds of things, then suddenly those connections become quite obvious and it seems to see that all those others, those white ones, are different. These guys, you know, so these these two and these two, the the these two and these two are what we would call first cousins, they're cousins. Um, but they're in and they're out when you start focusing only on descent. Same here. A group of siblings, a brother, a brother, and a sister. The sister's children are of her clan, but the brother's children are not. So there's a, there's a division right there. And yet, as I said, in everyday life, um, and especially in things like inheriting rights to harvest coconuts and sell them. It's often not that if, let's say, this guy has planted a lot of coconuts, that they are all inherited by his sister's children. Very often, they're passed on to his own children. Those children may give some gifts to those sister's children to assert their rights to it, but they often do so in ways that, that um, emphasize they don't need to totally cut them off. Now I'm going to talk about Renanga. When in, the, um, in an era, I began my field work in the late 90s, and that was a time when logging was really booming in this part of the world. But Renanga is small and steep and doesn't have a whole lot of trees, and it was not subject to large-scale logging. In 2007, 
a massive earthquake lifted the whole island out of the sea, so a tsunami trashed villages around the province, but Renonga just lifted up in the sea, went off of these reefs and never came back. It caused a lot of landslides. Now, ironically, a few years later, a few years before, there had been someone who had applied um, on behalf of his matrilineal clan, so something constructed like this. Actually, it was the clan of his father. Um, so it would have been somebody like this speaking for his father's clan. Tried to get a company to come. Years passed. It didn't happen. And then in the months after the earthquake, after there'd been massive landslides, um, uh, the company began to work in southern Renonga on areas that were really um, too steep to be logged as defined by the, um, by the national government. In this very same place, which these photos here are taken after the logging, after the company left, Nearly 10 years earlier, I'd attended a ceremony. It was a ceremony in which, I'm gonna go back to my kinship diagram. There was an old man, let's make him, um, let's make him Ego, who was nearing the end of his life. He had no children. He wanted somebody to come to this place and look after him and look after this place after he was dead. He said he called his sister's children, his younger sisters, and all of these clanmates would be called sisters. So he called all of his matrilineal relatives all the way back, distant generations, and nobody wanted to come live with him. So therefore, he asked his brother's children, son, to come and live in this place called Banyata. And the son came. So his nephew came with his wife and their children, and the ceremony I attended was, was them basically saying, okay, we're not of this matrilineage, but we're going to be here, and we're going to be looking after this area. They gave a whole lot of um, food and some money to their, this old man's matrilineal relatives and a whole bunch of other people with complicated connections to that place that I'm not gonna go into detail. But as they gave these gifts, which basically might be interpreted as a kind of payment, you know, I'm paying you for this land now, we've got it. They said, this is just a little bit of food, a token of our love for you as bro our brothers and sisters and aunties and uncles. Um, we're not really doing anything, we're just, we're just here. But of course, to anybody who knew anything, they were saying that, if you come here, you want to build a house, you've got to ask me first. So and it was an assertion of power that was an attempt to not assert power because to do that would be to tell other people they didn't have any rights. They weren't sharing in that property and therefore they weren't really family. Now all that fell to pieces when the company came. There's a picture of the logging camp. By the time I arrived, it had already left again. Um, and what happened... Um, there was that a matrilineal, uh, a, a tribal company, so a matrilineal, uh, the Degere Development Company, um, led by actually the son, the spokesman for a chief, let's call him the chief, and it was his son, registered themselves with the government as a tribal co development corporation. And in the clips I'm going to show you in a moment, you'll see another tribal development corporation. And they um, they got this license to log. Now, when that began, it had been, uh, there were some legal irregularities, and a lot of people rightly thought it was really stupid to log land that had been devastated by landslides um, only a few months earlier. And they took the case to the high court in order to contest the logging, saying it was basically was illegal. This is one of the women um, who were part of the, the clan that did bring the company ashore in hopes of getting the sorts of things, getting things like clinics and roads and things we take for granted. They didn't, they didn't get it, but that's what they hoped for. So there was a court case in the legal courts of the Solomon Islands, and it was initially about saying, hey, this procedure was wrong, it was illegal, and by the way, the land is too steep for logging, it causes too much erosion. 
But the high court sent those guys back um, and said, you have no right to say anything about this land unless you can prove yourself a tribal landowner. So they then dug back in the mythology um, because, in fact, as is the case in almost every place on Renonga that I've ever done any research on, there's an original clan and then there's one that migrated and got some rights from that original clan. And often people say, oh, well, we live together as brothers and we don't distinguish between one another. But the, the ones who contested the logging um, then went back to court constituted as a tribe, as a clan with a contestant and with a, with a different claim. And I think that's really sad because instead of being able to say, hey, this is bad for the whole community, they were forced to sort of say, hey, we're challenging your land rights. And in the end, the whole thing took two years and the company left with whatever profits it got. And the landowners who brought the company had this huge court bill that they couldn't pay and in the meantime, people had confronted one another with machetes in the bush, and there was none of the development that anyone hoped for. So it's quite a sad story. And I want to have you have a look briefly at a couple of clips um, and uh, from, from a similar community in the midst of a logging, uh, in the midst of a logging operation. It illustrates really nicely the kinds of contests that arise in development situations and specifically contests over who is and who isn't part of these kin-based groups. So the first, and it's also interesting to um, have a look at the gender dynamics because this film um, focuses on the distinction between men and women and their quite different perspectives on logging. Um, and uh, the women's voice in, in um, articulating a certain approach to kinship. So some of students in my tutes last week were quite curious about the centrality of women in the accounts of ritual and knowledge of land in Diane Bell's account and the relative absence of them in Smith's account. Does it have to do with the local social dynamics or the um, perspective of the ethnographer. And I'd encourage you, if you do, uh, uh, I'd encourage you to go watch that whole film, but also um, to, pay, to, to think about those kinds of gender dynamics. So let me just go to those clips if I can. Um, so this, this one starts out with, in the midst of a meeting and the old chief, and you'll see uh, very different kinds of, of leadership competing with one another. The old chief and a younger man who is in fact also the member of parliament. And actually I believe my computer is streaming quite slowly. So um, that PowerPoint will be up there so I'm going to ask you to actually um, follow those clips, those clips yourself. And you can discuss um, what's going on there and discuss particularly what the uh, woman who's speaking, Katie Sopa, what she's talking about when she says, um, she's, she says that people today don't share People today um, are, are fighting over who's part of the tribe, who's descended from the mother, and that's not custom. We have a matrilineal descent system, but it's not customary to cut people out. And there's also a, um, a part of a clip that, in which an older man rebukes his son for telling outsiders to go away. So... It's an interesting case study of what happens when for reasons that have to do with outside pressures around development, and I should say it's coming from the outside, but it's something that local people do um, embrace. They want a different standard of living. When, the, when those outside pressures encourage people to define themselves as a descent group rather than as a broader community. So to recap, 
whether we're talking about Melanesian land tenure or whether we're talking about the University of Western Australia, there's no one single model that captures all aspects of social reality. Our models, like this one, shape and depict, they don't just depict, they also shape social relationships. And you see that process going on as Cragger villages or villagers are recording their own genealogies. That's not just a record that's going to shape what comes next. And I also want to make the point that anthropological and sociological analysis is not just figuring out what model is correct, but it's also understanding how people use those models to understand and change their social worlds. And now that video is coming up. So I'm going to just let it uh, go. He's speaking a version of Pigeon, Pigeon talking about Speaking Pigeon. Okay. Farm society. Torangas farm society. One of what man come from me by make him. What man have me say? But you will have one make him good in this whole farm. Then no plan the yam by Bumaka him cut him long here. But him plan the Bamba you will have him good ya him. But a boy. After me to see me to me go, every bulka, long belly finish. Every sito me will make them, no more. Timber not in Sindra Longo, and not Sindra Longo, I think, Pelas and Wanzo are overlooking the cement along in that Pelas Yam. And walk me looking more, Miss Oren Moa. How will I develop and come by me? Me register nothing long here. Name belong him, raise them, but raise them, nothing long him. No, in something come out long him. Main talent, Kalena come, him come back and see by the lock long me. No good him, he was in this one, walk a me talent for who died that time. No good in this one, walk him in doing more thing. Okay, for the fourth time this time, however, I want to get rid of the executive. Secretary, you write it, Dr. Bani. I will be married in a minute to the Havora in a two and not exact of Yahujin. That's the vernacular Four language. Time. But the evil and nothing come up with them any solid ground. Why not evil over the outing? What is the mistake? Who not make them wrong something like that? That's the way we're going to change it. Huh? Why are they not wrong? When I'm not wrong, my brother will be the financial controller. Then I may even let them stretch it, it's sensitive. When I'm not wrong, my Jack, telling me like this will have time. Put on him very short. You will sit down outside and I'm full of jealousy and you'll do me what that kind of talk about. All of a sudden, I'm able to get it. When you talk about the chairmanship, you are talking about me. Okay, you're telling me. We are not seeing there again. They have we have we know what? What is the meaning of the how? How? You will tell them so that we hear it. When they know something is killing, tell them how straight this time. You know something. First time we have a dream, so me make a whole big black bottle here and me explaining the whole financial situation will happen right now. We have no more. They make pump later. Me tell them how many dollar royalty, how many dollar this, how many dollar this. From there to there, who are new here for whoever? After two or three weeks, another complaint. If you are not savvy how the whole these things and function, you keep yourself quiet and get out of the way. Me not pray to talk. My love me had pure blood half right, and I never care to talk about this like that. I will talk like evil people here. Negotiation for half right. So half right is the name of the of the tribe, the Tribal Development Company. Um, this next clip is a woman named Katie Sopi, who 
is speaking about how she feels that life, life has changed since the company came. But as before, this is very slow. I hope you have faster computers and I will let you do that yourself. So thank you very much indeed for your online attention. If you'd like to talk to me about things Melanesian or anthropology or anything else, please um, come along to my consult hours or contact me to make set up a meeting. Thank you.